Mighty works are accomplished in and for me. Continue to walk close to the great I am. Watch and know what you do for me will cause many jewels in your crowns. Continue to walk in my love and seek peace. Much will continually cause growth and comfort to those on your path. Oh. <clears throat> That's right, if somebody comes in, especially if you don't know them, get out of your seat and give them yours. That's right. But I came here to worship. You know why? I remember D.L. Moody. I think it was D.L. Moody. He was in a service one time and there was hundreds and hundreds of people outside. And he told the people in the congregation, he says, all you believers in this place, I want you to get up and leave so then believers can come in and get saved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if somebody comes in and you don't know them, you should be touching them. That's right. If you're a Christian, you should go up and say hi to them at least, touch them, do something to them. Don't cuss them out or nothing. <laughs> but do something, do something. Because I've known people who, who will come into a church and they will find out about the church in the first five minutes they're there. They'll find out about us the first five minutes they're there. Did somebody greet them? Did somebody tell them what was going on? Did somebody invite them in and set them down? Did somebody touch their life? And they'll, they'll find out who we are by what we do, yeah. not by right. what we say necessarily. Right. Now they'll come in and hear the preaching and they'll like that, but if they don't get touched by somebody, they won't like us. Why? Because you don't like them enough to touch them. I mean, if you want friends, get friendly. That's what the Word says. You want friends, be friendly. <laughs> so if you don't want friends, just be as grouchy as you want. <laughs> if you're looking to isolate, this you know, you can you can do that too if you want, I guess. Daniel, hi! What's happening, man? How's the East? It's good. <laughs> Eastern man. Tennessee, right? Woo! Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, that's the South. Yeah. I'm sorry. You got, a, you got an accent already? <laughs> nah, nah, I have no accent. I've been out in the muddies. Praise the Lord. All right. I was I was thinking about some things this week, and so I'm going to preach two sermons this morning. And this sermon will be completed on Wednesday when we get together here to listen to a video or watch a video on with um, Andrew Mo Womack, okay? And I'll tell you what it's about at the end of the sermon. But we're going to finish this sermon and this, this uh, teaching on Wednesday because he says it better than me, okay? I think he says it better than me. I preached a lot of things that he preached to me. You know, sometimes I get the things I'm going to preach from somebody else. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I actually plagiarized people. I plagiarized Paul before. I plagiarized Jesus. I plagiarized Peter. Huh? I plagiarized the Holy Spirit. That's right. I've said things that he said. <laughs> so, go with me, if you will, to Colossians, the second chapter. General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Gentiles eat pork chops. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. However you want to remember it. If you've got a great memory and you really don't need anybody to... Um, that's okay. Praise the Lord. Okay. Oh, this is it? Yeah. I didn't even write it down wrong. Colossians, the second chapter... We'll be reading the 13th to the 15th verse. And this is what we're kind of going to focus on this morning right at first. It says here in 13, he says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he, Jesus, has made alive together with him, having forgiven all trespasses. That's good. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, 
which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, in it being the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he made an open show of the enemy. He wiped him out in Rome the way they did this. They went out and fought against the enemy. If they were triumphant in their uh, endeavor fighting the enemy, they would come back and they would have a parade. If they weren't victorious, they'd come back and they wouldn't have a parade. And the common people, the ones that weren't soldiers, would still have to be afraid. But if they were victorious in their battle, they would come in and the, the kings and the leaders of the army would be brought at the end of the line. They'd cut their thumbs off and their big toes off. So they could never again hold a sword and they could never again stand in battle. They wanted the people to know you no longer ever and forever from this day on have to fear this person or their army. Isn't that the coolest thing? Now when Jesus said that he, uh, he disarmed principalities and powers and made a public spectacle of them, that's what he's talking about. He made a public spectacle of the enemy at the cross and disarmed him and made him of no effect in this world at all. I want you the enemy, I want you to know the enemy has no power right. at all over you. Amen. He has zero power. Amen. If you have received something from him, it's because he has deceived you and lied to you and you went for the lie. Mm -hmm. That's all the enemy has anymore is deception and lies. How do I know that? It says in the word, he deceived the nations. He deceived the nations. He didn't have power over the nations. He deceived the nations. He lied to them. And the nature of deception is you don't know you're deceived. That's the nature of deception. People don't know they're deceived. I don't know sometimes when I'm deceived. But when I catch, when you catch a person in a lie, at that point in time, you got them. You're no longer under their power. You are now uh, convinced that their character is beneath what you thought it was and they have no more dominion over you. Before that time, they might have had all kinds of dominion over you. They might have told you they were, a, they were a, a, a Navy SEAL who could whip anybody on the face of the earth. And somebody comes up and punches him in the chin and knocks him down, you go, that doesn't look so dang tough. <laughs> <laughs> a little guy knocks him down. Okay? So you think they're not tough anymore. So they brought these people in with their thumbs gone, and the, the people would spit on them, they'd mock them, they'd laugh at them. Why? Because the people wanted to know in their spirits, they had to experience that lack of fear. They had to know that this enemy can't beat me anymore. Okay? you got to know when you got to meditate on these scriptures. I've been meditating on these scriptures. The enemy has zero power. The only power he has over you is deception and lies. So if you're any bondage today, it's because that you've gone for the lie. You simply bowed to the lie of the enemy and did what he says. Okay. All right. The devil is a liar, the Bible says, and the father of lies. So when you go for a lie, you come on the devil's side, right? Okay. The purpose of the parade. So remember the parade. That's the first thing I wanted to say today. Okay? All right. Now in Hebrews 2, it says this. And I'm just going to go to these scriptures because I don't have that many today. Hebrews, the second chapter, the 14th and the 15th verse, says this. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who, through the fear of death, were in all their lifetime subject to bondage. So I want you to know something here. Fear of death opens a door for bondage. The fear of death opens a door for bondage. The fear of death will cause all kinds of crazy things to come upon you. It will destroy your boldness. It will, it, will, it will make you so all you think about is how you're going to live, not how you're going to serve the Lord. All It will make you think about nothing else except yourself. That's what the fear of death does. It gets you focusing on you or the devil. If you're focusing on the devil today, you're focusing on the wrong thing. This is not a battle against good and evil with both sides equal. 
I want you to know this isn't the yin and the yang. I'm talking the yin is way over the yang here. Far above all principalities and powers. His name is above every name that is named. Not only in this age, but that which is to come. God has put all things under His feet. This is not a battle between good and evil, and evil is just about as tough as good. Evil has no power over a Christian. Only what a Christian gives him. For the Christian, the battle is mostly right between his ears. The Bible says it over and over, 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. Oh, we, might as well, we might as well read that so it's, I don't have that many scriptures today. 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. It says this. Which, which one? Where is that? Isn't that what I said? 2 Corinthians 10. Is that what I said this morning, you guys? Yes. Okay, okay. So it says... Um, is it 5.10? It's 10 2. What's the matter with you guys? It's on the next page. I just jumped ahead of my notes a little bit. Okay. 10 2 says, But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as though we walked according to the flesh. For through the, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we are to bring our thoughts into obedience to Jesus Christ. When the enemy get, begins to lie to you, now watch this. Yes, I wrote down here, yes, there are demonic powers. There are hierarchies of demons. Yes, they are assigned to certain places. But how we fight them, I think we have been goofed up in our heads. We've gone and fought against the enemy in the second heaven and out there and stuff like that. If you're one of those people, I'm sorry. That's great. Go for it. Keep doing it. If it works, that's great. But what we do in them places, sometimes we focus our attention on the enemy rather than on God. We get to binding demons. We get to finding out what the principality over the city is. I could give a rat's kazoo what the power over the city is. What I want to do is spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and bring the truth in so the truth can make people free. I never saw in there where... Uh, anyway, let's go on here. So 1 Corinthians, it says, we bring every thought and we, we bring arguments and every thought, I think it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We bring thoughts into obedience of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we preach the word. And the Bible says in Romans 8, it says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's the truth that makes you free. Why? Why? The only reason you would be bound at this time is because of fear. You shall know that, that, what, say that again. False evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. So most of us have been baptized in unbelief. Absolutely baptized in unbelief. We watch TV, we listen to the radio, we uh, read magazines, we talk to other uh, people who don't really know anything about life at all, and we get to conversating with them, and we don't bring up the gospel at all. Well, that's, that's the most ridiculous thing. If you're in conversation with somebody, what should be going on in the back of your head is not what kind of car they have. No. It's how am I going to share the gospel with this person at this point in time? How am I going to touch this person's life? What is on your mind? I want you to know this guy named Smith Wigglesworth. I bring him up a lot because he was one of the men who would not feed his heart or mind on anything but the Word of God. That's all he would feed his heart and mind on. That was it. He hardened himself against unbelief. He was baptized in belief. <laughs> if you read the Word of God all the time and that's all you read, I want you to know you won't be thinking about anything else. When Abraham was 99 years old and God says, hey, you're going to have the kid, what did he do? He didn't, he didn't focus, he didn't study on, and he didn't consider his own body now dead. He knew he hadn't made love to Sarah in probably 25 years. The guy was 99. 
I don't know, maybe, maybe you could cut off about 97. I don't know. Anyway, he says Sarah's womb was dead. Neither one of them was happening. And he didn't look at that. He didn't look at the deadness of Sarah's womb. She's been barren her whole life. She's never going to have a kid. Now she's not far behind him. I think she's 90 at this point in time. She's old. I want you to know this wasn't a Sarah in the old days who lived for 700 years and she was still young and beautiful. No, the Bible says her womb was dead and she was old. Well advanced in age, okay? Now, I want you to know when God restored her and she had Isaac, a king wanted to marry her. So God must have restored her back to some kind of youth, I would say. I mean, I don't know. If I was a king and I was like uh, 30, I wouldn't be going after some 90-year-old. <laughs> Maybe you would. I don't know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you're 30 and you go after some 90-year-old, she's going to slap you silly. She won't put up with you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> go ahead. Try. I dare you. Go ahead. <laughs> she'd be, get away from me, you little work. <laughs> Why are they going to all that stuff? Oh, yeah. We have to take our thoughts captive. Okay, now watch this. Watch this. We're going to keep going here. So there are the, those things. We focus our attention on God, not on demons. So what is the antidote for deception? Truth. Truth. Hallelujah. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He deceived the nation, nations. He accused the brethren. How do you think he accuses you? He accuses you of facts, not truth. The enemy will accuse you with facts, not truth. Facts. You blew it yesterday. You kicked the dog. Oh, that was your husband. I'm sorry. You kicked the dog. So you're guilty. You're condemned. The truth is, Jesus Christ has set you free. Once you grasp the truth, deception loses its power immediately. Once you grasp the truth that, that he has made an open show of him and he's defeated him at the cross, once you understand that, get that into your spirit somewhere and realize the enemy can't have you anymore, at that point in time, you have a decision to make. Whether you're going to go with the lie or if you're going to go with the truth. The truth is the enemy has zero power. If you're under the enemy's influence right now, even if you're demonized right now, you don't have to leave this place demonized. Amen. You might need some help getting free, but I want you to know the truth. Basic, usually when you preach the truth, demons leave. I've seen people delivered of demons while they listen to the Word of God. Amen. Why? Because when you know the truth, the truth sets you free. It's like if I, if I was lying to somebody and all of a sudden they found out I was a liar, they wouldn't be under my influence anymore. And I know I'm saying this 57 times in different ways, but that's right. Deception's power and strength comes from the fact that we don't know that we're deceived. Once we know that we're deceived, duh. Okay. In John 17, 17, it says that God's word is truth. The antidote for unbelief. So that is why we meditate on God's word instead of on dot, dot, dot. What have you been meditating on? How will we ever make it? What are we going to do now? What if she dies? What if I can't work? What if the economy crashes? What if? Yeah, what if? Cheaper troopers, you know. Coulda, shoulda, woulda, if. Live there. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I want to read that. And I know you just shut off your brain because you know exactly what that says. <laughs> God forbid that we, ever, we should ever get to a place where we shut off our brain to the Word of God just because we know what it says. In Romans 12, 1 and 2 it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's interesting, huh? First we present our bodies to God, then we don't be conformed to this world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. So a few practical defense mechanisms. We fellowship with God, we commune with Him, 
and we love Him, and we constantly seek Him. I didn't say consistently. I said constantly. Okay? Let's go on. Okay. We fellowship with God's people according to the Word of God. That's why we come to church. That's why we go to Bible studies. That's why we hang out with people of faith. Now, are we going to uh, exclusively hang out with people of faith? Of course not. That would defeat the purpose of hanging out with people of faith. We're, we're, we're right. hanging out with people of faith so we can have faith to go hang around with people who don't have any. That's right. So we're an influence on them. They're not an influence on us. Now, if you're hanging around somebody and they're having a bad influence on you, get away from them. I mean, well, I'm going to change them. No, you're not. You don't missionary date. You don't missionary fellowship. If you're having, if somebody's having a bad influence on you, get away from them. Now, if you're having trouble with adultery and things like that, you don't go hang out at the cat house. It's just, if you're having trouble with alcoholism and things like that, you don't go hang out at the bar and try to uh, get people to repent of alcoholism. Find another ministry somewhere. <laughs> okay, let's go on. <laughs> okay, our b best defense is a good offense. In Ephesians 6, we find the armor of God. And I'm not going to go into the armor of God, okay? But it's practical to put on the armor every day. Go in, put on your armor. God, I believe that I am saved. So I put on the helmet of salvation. I thank you, Lord, for washing me in your blood and saving me from sin and the devil and the judgment to come. I thank you, Lord, for the shield of faith. I put it above everything else. And everything that comes my way will be quenched on that shield because I believe in you. Let's go on here now. A few practical ways. One of the things you can do is praise because praise is a powerful weapon against evil. It drives out lies and it drives out the liar. Once you know if you're having demonic influence in your house, turn on some praise music. Every day. The enemy doesn't like bread music. He just doesn't like bread music. I don't know. Or have somebody come in and clean your house out first. <laughs> I was going to sing a song, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. So it drives out the liars. Sometimes my thought life becomes tainted. And there's a battle that gets really intense inside of my head. So sometimes I have to rebuke the thoughts in Jesus' name and remind myself and my mind and my enemy that he has zero power over me. Sometimes I need to remind him and myself mm -hmm. because the, you ever get thoughts and the thoughts <coughs> keep going and, and then they get going and then uh -huh. they really get going uh -huh. and pretty soon you can't get a grip on them. Right. Sometimes you can't expel them with just the thoughts. Sometimes you have to expel them with the word of God. Uh -huh. You have to actually come against the devil like Jesus did and take over and say, no, that isn't the truth. You have zero power over me because it says in Second Corinthians, or I mean it says in Colossians 2, that you, God, may, okay, let's go on. Okay. So you counter with the lies with truth and continue in constant praise. If you've been dominated by the enemy, and this is where I wanted to get, if you've been dominated by the enemy's lies for a long time, even if you're demonized right now, you'll probably have to become a bit more aggressive in your emphasis on the word, on truth, and on who you are in Christ. You might have to rebuke a little more often. You might have to praise a little bit more. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay. And you might have to hang out with people of faith for a while and quit hanging out with other people. Good, bad company corrupts good manners. It just does. Yes. Bad company corrupts good manners. If you hang out with a bunch of guys that are swearing all the time, pretty soon you'd be swearing. Yeah. If, you, if that's your bent. It's not your bench. Every time somebody says Jesus Christ, you go, glory to God. Thank you for mentioning his name. I thank you. Oh, glory to his name. I want you to know you do that a couple times, they will shut up. <laughs> I, I like to tell them, he's the head of my church. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at you. Whatever it takes. And if you do that every time, I want you to know that you are more consistent and persistent than anybody else. You really are, because you know it's a war. They don't know it's a war. They're just talking. Praise the Lord. Okay. And then once you're free, it's fairly easy to stay in the truth and keep your freedom after you get free. It's fairly easy then. If you're finally free and you know that the enemy isn't going to come because he's a liar and this, this one little area of your life he can't get at anymore, it's fairly easy to stay free in that area. You can go back, like we were mentioning last week, if you take the one step 
program first, and you don't get it, and you go back to what you're doing, then you have to do the 12-step program. The 12-step program is difficult. I want you to know, I was talking to some people the other day, and this, this girl out here was talking to a, a lady out here, and she says, you're going to have to get up in the morning and not do that. Not any part of it. Don't even think about it. Don't go there. Just don't do that. You're going to have to. It's going to be hard. But you can't do that. You're going to have to trust in God and lean on Him with your whole heart. You can't do that. That's why people go into a recovery place and get clean for a while because they can't do it on their own. Some people have trouble with alcohol. Some people have trouble with other things. Greed. Uh, uh, whatever. Whatever. They go into recovery outfit so they can be around people of faith and not have anything to do with that thing for a few days. Yeah. I want you to know, Christians are pretty cool because once you get free for a few days, then it's not so hard. I want you to know, if you're demonized right now and the enemy has been lying to you and you're caught and in bondage, just stop for a day. Just stop for a day. And I guarantee the next day it will be easier on you. It's just the way it is because now you're turned away from the lie. Now you're doing the truth. Okay, if I did it yesterday, all day, not up till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> That's how we fast, don't we? Pass from 4 o'clock at night to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And then we eat right at 4 o'clock. I want you to know that, that some people think, uh, I was thinking about this, some people think sexual sin or sex is the same as uh, food. When you get hungry, you eat. When you get sexually aroused, you have sex, even though you're not married. I'm sorry, that's not the way the word works. That's not, in fact, that's what we're going to come to at the end here. We're going to come to fasting and prayer. You're going to learn how to train your body to do what you say mm -hmm. and not do what your body says. If you train your body, that your body might complain. It might say, you're going to die by noon if you don't have a sandwich. <laughs> Not you guys, of course. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so, sometimes you'll need help getting rid of the enemy. Okay? But once you get the devil out of someone, be sure you give him a prescription of truth to keep him from coming back. Don't just go casting demons out of people, because you have the power, by the way. If a de demonized person comes up to you, you can cast a demon out of him just like that. I hope you know that. Because yeah. you have the authority over him. Jesus says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Right. Go ye therefore. So you have power over the enemy. Absolute power over him. Okay. Because uh, you belong to Christ. You are the body of Christ. So we get the devil out of somebody. Sometimes we spread the word or hear the word through television, radio, CDs, books, DVDs, the internet. Okay, and I wrote down here, all are ways to spread and to hear the truth of God's word. So what do you put on Facebook? <laughs> what do your tweets sound like? What movies do you have on your TV? How do you use your internet? These are good things to know. I mean, are you spreading the word of God? Are you purposely, on purpose, doing things? Not just stumbling in. You know, or are we doing things on purpose? So we, we go to work on purpose. We go to play on purpose. We go to the internet on purpose. We go to the TV on purpose. We go to the radio and CDs and DVDs on purpose. There's a purpose for what we do. You only have a little bit of time left. There are only a few days left. Only a few days left for you. What you need to do is use those days correctly and find out what you can do in the kingdom. There is so much... Okay, let's go on. Okay, now, and I'm going to get to my point here. So, uh, all this stuff, it leads up to, uh, uh, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 4, 2, it says, all scriptures are uh, given by God, is inspired by God. It's good for reproof, rebuke, instruction in righteousness and such, okay? So, this leads up to my point this morning. Okay, in Romans 12, 3, it says, each one of us has been given the measure of faith. Many times we concentrate on faith rather than on what's really wrong with us. Have you received the measure of faith? Have you been saved and set free? Yes. Okay. So you have the measure of faith. 
How much faith does it take to move a sycamore tree and put it in the ocean? A lot. How much does it take? You guys read the word. How much does it take to put a mountain in the sea? A mustard seed of faith. It doesn't take hardly any faith at all, y'all. Hardly you got the measure of faith. You have the supernatural faith of God Almighty. He has given you that faith. All right? You talk to people you can't see. <laughs> That's weird. Okay? That's faith. You talk to and you believe that he talks to you. I mean, most people put you in a goofy house for that stuff. <laughs> okay. So there's a mustard seed. So <laughs> go to Matthew 17 with me and we'll get to the point. The point of all this, I want you to know that you have an enemy and his name is the enemy. <laughs> I don't even like saying his name. But I like saying enemy because then it puts me in a position of the offense or the defense. And I figured best defense is a good offense. So there in Matthew, the 19th, uh, 17th chapter. There's a boy that is healed. Now watch this. What chapter, Matt? In the 17th chapter. In the 14th verse. Matthew 17, 14. It's a good year. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He is an epileptic and he suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured that very same hour. When the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? Jesus said to them, Because your unbelief. And assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you say to this mountain, remove from here, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. However, this kind does not go out but by prayer and fasting. I preached on this probably three or four times this year. This type. It isn't talking about this type of demon. Demons are subject to the name of Jesus Christ. Period. You're not going to get some demon to subject to you just because you fast and pray. You're going to get some demon. Demons are subject to the blood. They're just subject to it, okay? You can't get... So let's go on here. So what is he talking about? This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. <clears throat> Who all here has ever fasted and prayed to have power over demons? I have. I have a lot of times. Okay? I believe that we fast and pray to get our hearts to a place where we can believe God. Because what fasting and prayer does is show you that you have authority. One thing fasting does is to show you have authority over your body. Now most of us in this place have never given our bodies a command or rarely given our bodies a command. Okay? We've never given our bodies a command. Therefore, when we go to our bodies and say, by the stripes of Christ you are healed, he says, who do you think you are? You never commanded me to do nothing. I'm rebelling against that. I refuse to be healed. And what your body's telling you, you go for because you've never commanded your body to do anything, so your body will rebel against you. Well, what fasting and prayer does, it brings you to a pl place where now you're in charge. Your body says you're hungry. You say, no, I'm not. I can go 40 days without getting really hungry before I die. So you're lying to me. I want you to know fasting once a week is good for you. Your body will tell you that it's not. Your body will go into all kinds of convulsions, get you headaches, feel sick. Uh, you think you're going to die by noon? <laughs> How do I know this stuff? Yes, okay. So unbelief, what is unbelief? Fear, worry, care, stuff like that. Lord, I believe by your stripes I'm healed. But in your mind, you're still worried about it. Right? You have the faith. The disciples, when they were going to cast out that demon, had all the faith in the world. They've been casting out demons for a week. But this demon wouldn't come out. So he was foaming at the mouth. He was there laying on the ground, falling into the fire, falling into the thing. And their natural unbelief says it didn't happen. That's the kind of unbelief. There's three kinds of unbelief. One is ignorance. You just don't know what the truth is. 
The second one is unbelief. You've been taught wrong. Okay, both of those are cured by <laughs> taking the truth of the Word of God, finding the truth in the Word of God, and not being ignorant anymore and getting the right teaching. Okay, it's harder to erase bad teaching than it is to just erase ignorance. I'd rather have an ignorant guy than a, a guy that's been taught forever that speaking in tongues is from the devil and the, the gifts went out in the age before this one and all this, you know. Those kind of guys are hard to convince. You have to get them in the Word for a week just to get them to believe that God would do something for them. Okay? The third kind of unbelief is just natural. This natural thing that says, you can change your mind, but you can't change your feelings. I still feel bad. I still see the guy foaming at the mouth. I still see Regina with a cast on her leg. I still see people in bondage and things like that. Okay? So... In James 1, 7 through 8, and I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures, he says a double mind is a man is unstable in all his ways. How does he get anything from the Lord? Okay? In Mark eleven twenty three, 23, it says, If you speak to this mountain, go into the sea and do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, you'll have what you say. But you do not doubt in your heart. I don't know about you, but that isn't what I got. In Romans 4, Acts Romans 4. I'm just going to read this because I didn't write it down. Romans 4, 18 and 19 say this. It says, So who contrary to hope, he believed in hope, they became a father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And being not weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead <laughs> since he was 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, this is the one I was talking about before, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. So he did not waver in unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. Okay? Your faith you have already. Once something happens to you and you get rid of unbelief, then you can have what you want. Mm -hmm. So this is how we're getting rid of unbelief. All right. In Mark 9, uh, I, that's where it says he's, he falls down and foams at the mouth and stuff. So I believe their unbelief came from our natural senses. This type of unbelief. Okay. You get that? Right? Okay. So the first two are got rid of by renewing your mind. Okay. Now. Spiritual warfare is, is mostly individual. And the reason I believe we're supposed to fast and pray in these coming <coughs> days is because I know a lot of people who've begun to prosper and their bodies have become broken and they can't work. Okay? God, the Bible says God has given us the ability to get wealth. Mm -hmm. Now, wealth doesn't just come to you out of the clouds. He doesn't create money. He doesn't print money like some people. He, he brings money through other people. And a lot of that comes through what we do. And it comes through what we sow and what we reap back. Okay? Mm -hmm. But a lot of us have been hindered by the enemy, I believe, in our bodies. And some of us have been hindered in our minds. A lot of people that I've talked to of late had a really hard time with the enemy these last couple of weeks. Really difficult time with the enemy, trying to get loose of some bondages, trying to get free of some things. Just terrible things happen to them. Other people, what were we talking about? What else was, was going on? Oh, you're crazy. People are crazy. Yeah. I've run into two at least this week that are absolutely gone. Nuts. Okay? So I believe that the enemy has convinced people... Mm -hmm. And they've gone for the lie. And I believe as we begin to fast and pray for these things and get our unbelief out of the way so we can pray in faith and believe God that some of these things will just be cleared up just like that. Amen. Yeah, people have lost hope. Finances. Finances, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, the Bible says he's given us the ability to, to get wealth. So God's given us the ability to get wealth. And a lot of people are just sitting around, they've lost hope and will not go to work. They're stuck, they're laying in their beds till noon, wondering why they aren't making it. And I'm serious, you guys, I'm serious. There are actually people like this. 
They'll lay in bed till noon and wonder why they're not making it. Wonder why they can't get a job and they go look for maybe one a week. I wonder why I can't get a job. I just can't get a job in this town. I know a person that came into this town had two jobs by noon. So jobs are available here. Work is available here. All you got to do is go out and get it. A lot of people have gone out and tried to get work, have been rejected in one job and won't go look again. Why? Because they bought this thing from the enemy that says, you're a failure, you're rejected, you're, it's going to happen every time. Or God doesn't want you to work. God does not, God, God, the Word of God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. And it also says, the hunger of a man's mouth will cause him to do stuff. You get hungry enough, you're going to go to work and make some money, get some food. It's just the way it is. The Bible is, is, is replete, if anything else, about the, the work ethic and things that God uses people to do. It's wonderful. I, praise the Lord. Okay. So we retrain our bodies. Okay, in Matthew 4, 4 it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Here we have it. Do we really believe that we don't live by bread alone? Do we really believe we'll make it if we fast the whole day? Till the morning. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I know it's 4 to 4. We need to retrain ourselves. We believe God is our source. He will sustain me today, not food. That's what you tell your body. God going to sustain me today. He said He would. Okay? This is good for you. The question is, who rules whom? Who rules whom? Does your belly rule you, or do you rule your belly? Does your body rule you, or do you rule your body? When your body tells you to go across the street and have, commit adultery with that woman over there, do you rule your body, or does your body rule you? Some of us just go, okay. <laughs> well, let's not get on that guy. How about the guy that's uh, uh, 150 pounds overweight, and he said, in the, in the, the enemy said, you got to go over there. There's a chocolate, bunch of chocolate donuts over there. You should go over there and eat those. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because I'm hungry. <laughs> You're not hungry. <laughs> Your mouth is hungry. <laughs> I said sometimes in those potlucks, I say, why is my stomach so full and my mouth still hungry? <laughs> I love potlucks, man. Ooh. <laughs> buffet the body, right? Buffet the body. <clears throat> Actually, it's buffet the body. Bring it under subjection so it doesn't rule. The word is pretty explicit on this, okay? Uh, your body isn't bad. It's it was just not made to rule. Your body isn't bad. It just it wasn't constructed to rule you. That's why that's why everybody gets so goofed up when we do. Your body was made for God and God for the body. Woo! Glory, glory to God. Your body has told you what to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat. Oh, I got to read this. Most of us haven't given our bodies an instruction for years or ever. So your body will rebel when you tell it to do something. In Hebrews 5:14, it says we retrain ourselves and we train our senses to understand good and evil. Sometimes for you guys, eating is evil. It isn't just not good for you, it's evil. And if you see it as evil, then you will repent of that thing, bring it to the cross, get forgiven. God can't do anything with, it's not good for me. God can do something with sin. He can, he can forgive it and wash it from you. Hallelujah. If it's not right, then it's evil. Praise the Lord. Fasting and prayer will help you respond to God better. It doesn't make God respond to you better. It doesn't make demons respond to you better. <laughs> Faith becomes like a sixth sense in us as we begin to uh, focus on the Word of God and focus in God. Faith becomes like it comes as seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and, and whatever the other one is. Okay? It becomes in feeling. It becomes like a sixth sense. We function by faith. It just becomes something we do all the time. It's something we, we know. We harden ourselves against unbelief, just like old Smithy Wickles were. <laughs> we harden ourselves against unbelief. We've been baptized in unbelief. Let's baptize ourselves in the Holy Ghost and get baptized in belief. Baptized in the truth. Okay. God's ability and willingness are not in question here. <clears throat> receiving what is already supplied is a challenge before us today. 
I believe God has supplied everything you need. All you need, God has supplied you. If you're born again, you're His children. He takes care of you, flat out. Uh, there was a guy named, um, what's the guy's name with, with the orphanages? Come on. Mueller, George Mueller. George Mueller opened some orphanage. And he decided that he was going to prove to people that God was faithful. So he never asked anybody for anything. He just simply believed God was going to bring him what he needed as he ministered in the place God told him to minister. And he worked his butt off. Not for money. He worked his butt off for the children that he was taking care of. Okay, that's a full-time job. And God brought in what he needed. They sat down for breakfast one time. I think there was 50 kids or 150 kids. They sat down. They had no food. None at all. Sat down at the breakfast table. Come on, kids. All had their plates and stuff. Let's thank God for the food. Kids are looking around. Like, what food? We walk by faith, not by what we see. God has promised He will supply all our needs. He will supply all our needs. So they sat down and they thanked God for the food they were about to eat because they knew they needed that thing. And God, there was a knock on the door. Some guy come in with a great big 50-pound bag of onions, and they had onion soup for breakfast. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God supplied their needs. Always God will supply our needs. And we can prove Him in this, says the Lord. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing on you that you can, can, don't even have room to receive it. Most of us are building our own little siled houses and we have no idea what building the kingdom of God is all about. That's a different sermon for a different day. Okay, so this is a challenge before us. We've seen now the devil is defeated completely, correct? Yes. Zero power, correct? Yes. Faith is already ours, correct? Yes. Okay, we are believing and not seeing the right results sometimes, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe I think 9 out of 10 times it's because of this kind of unbelief. This is what I believe about you guys. You guys have been taught the Word of God right. You guys are believing the Word of God right. You're praying in faith right. You're confessing the right things. But still, there's this gnawing unbelief that plagues us in the back of our minds and in our guts. It just plagues us and plagues us and plagues us because we see things and we believe the things we see rather than the things we believe. And we quit and we stop and we back off instead of pressing into God and watching what He does. And the way um, uh, uh, Womack said it, um, Smith Wigglesworth was, was, remember I told you the story 50 times. Mm -hmm. She was praying for a woman. She was on the stage. She had a great big goiter in her stomach. It looked like she was pregnant. They brought her up. She couldn't stand up. They brought her up. He, he, said, let her, he said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. He says, let her go. And she just crumbled onto the ground. Pick her up. Well, she can't. Well, picked her up. He says, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And let her go. Down she went. Pick her up. He picked her up and he prayed again. He said, let her go. He said, we're not going to let her go. Are you kidding me? She's about to fall down again. He says, and some guy in the audience yells out, leave her alone. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have done the same thing. You know, leave the poor woman alone. He says, I know my business. He says, let her go. Just like that. And he let... He told again and in the name of Jesus and she fell down and she, that tumor fell out of her and she went running around the whole audience just healed in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he was baptized in belief. He had no unbelief. And Womack was pulled the guy out of a wheelchair once because he believed. He had faith to believe. I'm telling you it takes faith to drag a guy out of a wheelchair. It takes faith to do that. So he had the faith. So he pulled him up out of the wheelchair and he let him go and he fell right on his face. Smashed his nose on the carpet. Got all goofed up. And what happened? All the groans in the audience and things like that. His, he said his belief just drained out. And belief came in and doubt came in. He got him in his wheelchair, apologized to him and the case, place kind of filtered out and everybody's bummed out and goofed up. Why? Because he didn't have the faith that old Smith Wigglesworth had. He didn't know that God healed him already. He didn't know if he stood him up a couple more times, he was going to be healed. He hadn't read about the guy yet. See? Sometimes God will tell us to do something and we'll go do it and we'll see the results are wrong and we'll stop instead of pressing ahead in faith. 
and believe in God for things. So I believe that kind of unbelief goes, because the Bible says this type does not go out but by prayer and fasting. If this type goes out by prayer and fasting, I want that to go out. Don't you? I can't get rid of it any other way. I can't get rid of what I feel. Because my thinking is right. I have faith. I believe God for things, but I'm not seeing the results that I want to see. So if this type just, all we have to do is fast and pray to get, pray to get rid of it, okay. Right? Yes. Praise the Lord, okay. Do I like to fast and pray? I love it, man. I love to fast and pray. Speak about faith, by the way. See, it just spoke out my doubt. I love fasting and prayer. If it gets rid of this, that's what I like. So on Wednesday, we're going to bring this video by Andy Womack. He's going to talk about prayer and fasting and what it has to do with unbelief. I want you to know, he brings it out really, really good. And so if you want to get rid, because we're going to fast and pray on Thursday. Whole congregation, we're going to fast and pray on Thursday. Okay? So you get your bellies ready. Eat a lot on Monday, <laughs> Tuesday, Wednesday. So you get all pumped up. If I was you, I wouldn't do that. I'd slack <laughs> off. I'd you know, shrink your old belly down a little bit. <laughs> but we're going to fast and pray all day. Okay? From breakfast to breakfast. Okay? We're going to go through the night without eating. I want you to know, Four o'clock in the afternoon to four o'clock in the afternoon is hard, but if you know you're going to eat that day, it ain't so hard. That's true. But if you know you're not going to eat till the next morning, you're going to be crying out to <laughs> God Almighty to give you strength. Because it's, you know, going to bed hungry is a drag. Then it gets, what, it, what happens to us too is we get a little more compassion for those who say they're hungry. That's true. I'll tell you this last story and I'll quit. I was, uh, I was talking to some people over and over and over these people. This was I was a young Christian. And they kept telling me they were hungry. They were hungry and they were tired and they are hungry and they are tired. And I didn't understand what hungry was because I'd never gone without a meal in my life. And I was like 20, I don't know, 25, something like that. Never gone without a meal. Didn't have to. I, you know, didn't have to. Anyway, I decided that I was going to find out what hungry meant. So I went without eating for five days. And I want you to know, when they say hunger just kind of dissipates after a few days, they lied. <laughs> I thought I was going to starve to death that whole time. Just hungry all the time, every minute of that time. But after that, I had compassion on people. When they came up to me and said they was hungry, I was getting, get in my car, we'll go get you something to eat right now. There's something that has to happen to you before we talk about anything else. Mm -hmm. When somebody says they're sleepy, they haven't slept for a few days, I want you to know you need sleep more than you need food. Mm -hmm. I had a guy come to me once, he hadn't slept for like three days, hadn't eaten for five days, something like that. And I said, let me get you a sandwich and I'll get you a place to sleep. He says, if it's all the same to you, I'd like to lay down for a while first. Whoa. And then I realized what that meant when I haven't been to sleep for a few days. And so when somebody says that to you, maybe they're not kidding. And maybe you should just let them lay down on your lawn or, or get them under a blanket somewhere if it's winter time. So anyway. I had a hitchhiker like that once. I picked him up in um, Wells to bring him out to Reno. Mm -hmm. and. He was tired and hungry, mm -hmm. but he wanted to take a nap. First. And he slept until we got to uh, Battle Mountain, and then he woke up and wanted popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> popcorn. That's good. Popcorn. Come on, let's hear with Go ahead. Pastor, could I tell about Dan? Yeah. Okay. That's all right with Dan? Yes. That's right. Okay. Let me move forward so y'all can hear me. Um, all y'all. Y'all, all y'all. Yeah. Okay. Talk to my daughter too. <laughs> um, we had something happen um, this last Sunday um, and last Wednesday um, at the clothing giveaway. Dan came in and asked for prayer for his granddaughters. And those of you who were here last week you know on Sunday he asked for prayer. So we prayed with him, and then Sunday came, and. After church, we went home and we watched God's Not Dead. <laughs> and at the end of God's Not Dead, it said to text all the people in your contacts 
and put just God's not dead to start the talking and the discussions. In that time, my husband did the same thing. I mean, we picked up our phone right after the movie, and it was 10, 15 at night. And they convicted both of us to do it. He picked up his and texted that, just God's not dead. A few moments later, he got a text back from a girl that he works with, a woman that he works with, and the woman texted him and said, my brother's daughter, Haley, needs our prayers. So I was like, okay. And he was going to text her back, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, Haley, I know that word Haley, and I went into my prayer request. Haley is Dan's granddaughter. So I called Lana and said, who is Dan to Haley? And she said, Grandma. So he texted back and said, do you know a Dan? And she texted back and said, that's my brother's wife's father. So it went all the way around, and it is being prayed for, and I will tell the next service too, but Dan's granddaughter is going to get a miracle. Because everybody in this church, and my husband works with this lady and knows nothing about her personal life, and it came back to him, and so now it's even stronger. So God is working through Dan and his wife, and the brother, and the sister, and that child, and Leilani, his other granddaughter. They all need healing, they all need prayers, and we've got to keep doing it because it's kingdom circle. It has gone all the way around, and we've got to spread the word and pray for this child. In these next few days, why do we uh, focus our prayers? You guys all pray, I know that. So, what's your granddaughter's names? Haley and Leilani. Haley and Leilani. Put that on your prayer list and pray for them every day. If I was you, I'd pray for them for at least 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem like very long. Go ahead, try it. Vicky mm -hmm. has an awesome praise report on Leilani. Praise the Lord. Leilani, like we were told in the beginning that she would not live to be born. Right. Her heart was just not going to make it. She lived to be born. She had open heart surgery at five days. They did whatever it is they did, and she went home five days after the surgery. Mm -hmm. They brought her in last Tuesday for her second open heart surgery, mm -hmm. where they had to rebuild her heart because basically she had one chamber instead of four, and they didn't work, whatever. Yeah, right. They did whatever they had to do, said she'd be in the hospital for three to five weeks afterwards, and as of yesterday, they're talking about sending her home now because the doctor who invented the procedure, so it's not like he doesn't know what he's doing, he is blown away by how she's done. And she's done. There you go. There you go. How many days to go? Last Tuesday. Yeah, that's what I wow. thought. Wow. Today is the fifth day. Wow. Not five weeks, wow. five days. Five days. But and all, we, also, on the first surgery, when they expected her to be there for five to seven weeks. Yeah, she was home in a week. <laughs> she is amazing. She is strong. She, they said heart babies don't eat. Yeah, right. They took the breathing tube out Wednesday, and she was eating Wednesday. How old is this little baby? She's four months. Four months. Oh, four months. Second surgery of four months. Wow. Oh, God. Yeah. Hallelujah. And it is the power of prayer. Yeah. It is the power of And Dan asked for prayer. Wednesday before last, and we started praying. And, you know, we talk about the faith. That night that we were in Reno, over on Harvest Avenue, or at that church that Kathy Cox or something like that, and she asked if someone had, you know, this was before we did ever seen an ultrasound. This was when the very earliest stages uh, Kayla's pregnancies and I stood and said yes and the, she gave a word and I stood on that word I called her that night and we have Praise the Lord. stood on that word all this time just in even the, the times that are really really tough 
I don't have the emotions to show, but my honey is going through emotional things. And I'll just look at her. Who's believe? Whose report do we believe? Amen. We re believe the report of the Lord. Praise the Lord. And one thing we're going to do on Wednesday too, we're going to uh, bring all the things out that we're believing God for, Praise God. and yeah. trade those things, and we can concentrate on one thing. We can concentrate on one person's thing. Yeah. So you'll be the intercessor for them, the, the prayer for them, as you begin to seek God and receive things. And it's just an idea so we can get personally involved in each other's lives. Because yeah. sometimes church. you just throw stuff up. Here in the church now? Yeah. Six yeah. Yeah. Would you guys rather fast tomorrow or Thursday? What? Thursday. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I hate putting stuff off, man. You might be a real cook Oh, yeah. <laughs> Me too, yeah. Okay. So let's do this. Thank you, God, for allowing us the, uh, the privilege of living for you. God, I thank you that the things we learned today, that the enemy has no power over us, nor over our finances. It's just according to your word that your finances work, Lord. And so we don't buy the lie anymore. We buy your truth that says you supply all our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, you have rebuked the devourer for our sakes. And we know your economy, and it is working for us because we're working it. And we praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Also, if anybody needs some milk, please ask Dan. Ask me about it right now because we are blessed. Uh, I've got a lot of milk. Not I, but we have a lot of milk down there, and I've just put it in the freezer. But really, do not be shy. If you guys need some milk, we have an abundance of milk. So if you need some, get a hold of Dan. He'll go down there right now and open it up for you and get some milk. Anything else? Y'all. Jesus is Lord and we thank you. This is the anniversary weekend of the first time Vicki ever came to church here. And it's been wow. uh, nine years. Nine years. Hallelujah. It's been a roller coaster ride, but it's been a faith ride. And it's awesome. Lisa, go ahead. I have a prayer request. His name is Robert. He lives in Uruganda, and he's a pastor, and he wants to buy the church from the landlord uh -huh. and property, and it's also a school, and he needs the monies, so he needs prayer for that. So he asked me to please really? your church to pray um, because the landlord got to sell it to him. So, and he gave me the prices, but you know what? It, it's foreign. I don't understand. So we just need to pray that he's able to get some money for the church. And where is he at? Uruganda. His Uruganda. name's Robert, and I can't pronounce his last name. God does it. Yeah. Yes, God does. Lord, we pray for Robert right now. Yes. Yes. Pray, God, that you'd give him all the money he needs to do that. Yes. Yes. Lord, you, you are the one who supplies all his needs. And so, God, this is a need of His. He believes it is. He's asking for prayer for it. We're coming to You. Believe in You, God, that You have given Him the means to prosper. And we thank You, God, for sending Him this money. I pray that You'd show the person that's supposed to bring this money to Him or the people that are supposed to bring this money. Show them right away, God, so they can get that done. And any hindrances standing in their way, I pray, Lord, that thing would be taken out of the way so He can get that money to Him and so that He can have this church. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Yeah, um, Chris's oldest son, who's 17, he's uh, kind of went down the wrong path for a while. He's, uh, he's having to come to deal with some things, and he told me, Graham, I have to pay for what I've done and what I did wrong. And so he's probably looking at CYA or something. You know, it's that whole situation there. And, um, they waited for a long time to charge him, so I hope they just don't charge him like an adult. And I'm really scared for him. I tell him every day to spray. And my son, when he was 17, he went through some hard times, and I stuck by him, and we prayed, and he's good as, 
fit as anything now. So I keep telling Michael, you know, this is an opportunity. Maybe you're here for a reason. It's going to be hard. But you have to believe that things are going to get better. So I just need somebody to pray for my friends. Michael. Michael. And I have a grandson also that is going through a tough situation. He's in jail. He turned 18, made a mistake, yeah. and we're praying that they don't charge him with what they're trying to charge him with so that he can get out. He is praying. That's he is reading a Bible in, in jail, mm -hmm. and we just pray that he gets through this and that it doesn't ruin his life. So, Lord, we thank you for leading both these kids to uh, jail and a place where you could get their attention. We thank you, God, that you love them enough to shake them up so their lives will come out on the right end. So we're praying, Lord, that these two boys would understand what your will is for their life and get in on it. And thank you, God, for leading them this way. And I thank you, God, for drawing them out. And we pray, Lord, that you give the judge wisdom and your will would be done in this situation completely. And we turn to you right now, God, and we trust you completely. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Amen. The, the judge told Michael straight to his face because, of course, his father's in prison and always has been all their life. So they bring Dad over from some, wherever he's been, and he just gets to watch everything. He doesn't get to say nothing to the kids or nothing. The judge tells him right in front of his father, which I still love him. There's faith. I am. I love Frank. I do. He's got a heart. But the circumstances have just left my daughter's life a mess. And the judge told Michael, I don't want you to turn out like your father. Okay. Right in front of Frank. So Frank could probably agree with him. It, oh. That's right. And I just keep telling Mikey he has to go Tuesday to court and and sometimes I think they waited long enough to charge him as an adult because it's pretty serious stuff. Well, God knows what he's doing. Yeah, that's all I can say. And one thing we don't want to get into is worry. That's right. You get into faith. That's right. Yeah. And believe God for stuff. And whatever happens to the kid, if you remain in faith, then that is the will of God for his life. That's right. And then you can trust God for the rest. That's right. Our, our prayers for our kids used to be, oh, God, don't let them die while they're learning this. Mike's not at that point where he reads the Bible yet, and Go ahead, yeah. I just hope he gets there. You know, you know, I, I know. I pray for him every day. So I'm just going to put this out there for the spirit of folks to, uh, Lord God, I lift up the property on the other side of my home. The, the desire, Lord God, of uh, my friend that passed away so many years ago, we had talked about, Lord God, that his property would come to the uh, to the church. Mm -hmm. So, Father, uh, you know what's going on in that whole family situation and everything about it. But, uh, Lord God, if uh, Lord God, I just petition you, Lord God, for the fulfillment of that to be in your will. Amen. Even though it wasn't in his will. Thank you, God. Jesus. Jesus. You know, Amen. right before we leave, uh, we need some money right now, and we want to buy that place and things like that. But for me, I'm so practical, I don't see a way to pay for it. Therefore, I don't even consider things that I can't pay for. And so I need to get past it. And that's some of the reason I want to fast and pray too, so we get our minds and our thoughts right so we can receive from God what we need. Amen. And, if, you know, if it feed, whatever. So praise the Lord. Well, God bless you all. So Thursday yeah. morning. Thursday this morning. Past all day. Yeah, till Friday morning. Are you still? Is Regina still having um, Bible study Monday? Absolutely. Okay. And Lana's having it Wednesday. Wednesday at nine. Wednesday, Wednesday at nine at her house. Monday at nine at Regina's house. Lord God, I ask you, Lord God, to. Uh, Restore, quicken, and do things so that uh, Matt hears his word that he shared this morning on faith <laughs> and follow your will, Lord God, and that for Matt 
he receives a powerful, awesome anointing of faith that that property will be paid through, set aside. Bless us, bless your church, bless the things that you have given to his spirit on how to utilize that property. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And I ask this, Lord God, not knowing how to say all these things, but this is my prayer, Lord God, in Jesus' name. The faith that I have for my granddaughters, we have for that property. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a ruby day. I will go down to the...